and opinions expressed by callers, guests, and hosts do not necessarily reflect those of the Black Talk Radio Network and Black Talk Media Project. Black Talk Radio is new black media for the new millennium. Let your wise rise up, see the signs of the times, if it's time, rise up, rise up. When death and hell dwell among all God's people, when those we chose and trusted have become completely corrupted and inherently evil, when the feast that feeds you starves our father's children, when snuff porn and pedo forms begin to get top billing, rise up. When famine claims millions, when justice gives blind eyes to billions, when the Lord's anger is no longer feared, if his protection is gone and your enemies are near, if you've seen the seas spill over and the mountains shake, break, and fall, if the moon ever turns blood red and you can't see the sun at all, rise up, no matter if the prize is high in the skies or deep. And welcome to New Abolitionist Radio on the Black Talk Radio Network, a program that seeks to educate, inform, and agitate on the issue of 21st century legalized slavery. Hosted by social activist and spoken word poet Max Parthas with New Abolitionist and Activist Johanna and Raya and Black Talk Media Project founder Scotty Reed. On this program, we discuss recent news on legalized 21st century slavery and trafficking, along with projects and people who help, who help combat it. Today is the May 10th, 2017 broadcast of New Abolitionist Radio, and we hear that within Trump's D.C. dictatorship, the beatings will continue until morale improves. On this day, in 1869, the presidents of the Union Pacific and Central Pacific Railroads met in Promontory, Utah, Utah, to drive a ceremonial last spike into a rail line connecting their railroads, thus making transcontinental railroad travel possible for the first time in U.S. history. Every part of it was made possible through slavery, convict leasing, and free labor. Remember that the time you ride the rails. Our list of potential stories to cover today are Making History in My Home State of New Jersey, 2017 Democratic gubernatorial candidate Bill Brennan is running as a slavery abolitionist saying we can connect today's incarceration nation directly back to slavery. It is exactly the reason they're doing it. Uh, Gotta love that. Also, uh, Mississippi goddamn, quoted Nina Simone, the anniversary of her passing was two weeks ago. We're going in on Mississippi today. Just too many stories are coming out, and we want to connect a few dots so you can see the bigger picture. Scotty has been keeping close eye on D.C. politics and what's going on there, and he's going to break some of that down to us. We've always got more information than we can put into one program, so be sure to follow us on New Abolitionist Radio on Facebook so you can stay abreast. Our abolitionist in profile is John Brown, whose birthday was yesterday. We'll read his final words. Our rider of the 21st Century Underground Railroad is Jerry Miller, who on April 23rd, 2007, after 24 years in a cage, he became the 200th person in the United States exonerated through DNA evidence. In our new segment, For Freedom's Sake, A History of Rebellion, we'll be remembering Nat Turner's Rebellion. Got a question or comment? Just call toll-free from the United States or abroad at 866-510-9025. You can chat with us and others by logging in at uberconference.com slash Network. Once again, I'm Max Parthas. What's happening, Scotty? Hey, what's there, up, man? Max? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> As you know, you know that um, the new computer is, I got to send it back to the shop. And this one kind of reacts kind of slow, especially, you know, when I've been doing a lot of stuff. Um, and Wednesday is one of our most busiest days. Um, but I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm like everybody else, man. I'm surviving behind these enemy lines, trying to come up with a plan, you know, to uh, liberate us. So that's what's going on with me. Uh, how's everything with you and the fam? Um, everything is good. My daughter's been going through some ailments lately. You know, they stopped the chemotherapy. 
things on her. So she's not doing that anymore. And it's uh, always a percentage chance that the cancer will come back. And they've given her some kind of medication that really puts her in a lot of pain. So I've been a little worried about her. Oh, I'm always going to be worried about her now, I guess, for from now on. But uh, other than that, you know, everything is good. I've been kind of busy in the past week. I try to stay doing something like you, brother. You know what I mean? I uh, finally did the interview on the Convention of States with uh, Eddie Conway on the Real News Network and uh, also did another interview yesterday uh, with Vanessa Sparks and uh, Brother Asafu was on the line and Vic uh, was also there. And we talked about slavery and human trafficking and the march in particular and how the Convention of States might be used as a something we could use as a tool in getting what we want done. So that was pretty interesting yesterday. Now, I I'll probably talk more about that later tonight. I, I have a question. Now, they're not talking about yes. the constitutional convention that uh, conservatives and corporations are quietly working on. That is that something different? I haven't seen the video yet. Uh, well, we discussed the Convention of States, which uses the Article 5 uh, back loophole to be able to uh, change the Constitution, basically add amendments, okay. take away amendments, things like that. Yeah. So uh, we were talking about how that might be something that we could use, even though at the moment it seems to be controlled by what we would call our opposing uh, force there, you know, uh, conservative Republicans, uh, not all of them. Of course, Prison I can't slavers. do a blanket statement on anybody, but alt rights, Alex, the Tea Party, these are the people that are, are running this whole thing. Well, you know, um, I had been doing some research on that. I was talking to Otis today, and um, I forget the lady's name, um, Sally, I believe, down there in Florida. Um, where she actually was trying to become one of the delegates for a constitutional convention for for Florida, but they kicked her off, and she says she's trying to get back on. But um, I plan to do a video after I get more information. Um, I might interview a couple of people or have like a panel, video panel um, discussion on this constitutional convention because Texas... Uh, two or three days ago became the 11th state to recently sign on for that constitutional convention and it's not getting mainstream attention. The only way I found out about it is because <laughs> and it kind of like you know puts me behind on a lot of things but I subscribe to a whole bunch of different you know uh, information sources and that's the only way I found out about it because I had put a Google alert out for a constitutional convention. But then I read another article, Max, that scared me. It may actually be 28 states because I think you only need 34 states. But over the past two decades, states have been passing reg resolutions uh, uh, authorizing their participation in a constitutional convention. So again, I still need more information. So while most people are talking about well it's 11 states now well that's just recently and it's not known for it's not clear to me on if those other states that had done this let's say 10 years ago uh if they will have to pass another one or if that will stand which will put the number at 28 which really scares me because of who's in control of it now, do I think we need a constitutional? And, and Otis shared with me that Article 5 that you were talking about. That's another way that you can make an amendment to the Constitution. But if these guys, look, like you mentioned, Alec, don't think George Zoli, you know, CEO of GEO Group and these other private prison profiteers won't have a seat at that table. And... Another article I read, Max, where it was a, a person in the Democratic Party was talking about, we got to stop this. Well, I don't think you can stop it because right now Republicans control a majority of states in the United States in this what I'm calling the age of Trump. So I don't know if you can stop it. And so instead of us being caught, and I'm when I say us, I'm talking about abolitionists. Instead of us being caught on the outside as some people will have us with a protest sign in our hand we need to be in that room with a seat to the table because you know I can compromise with some of the things that they want 
that I have agreed with in the past. That's like a limit on uh, t- a term limit on these congressmen and senators that you can only serve so many terms. No, you're not going to stay uh, on, in this government job for 20, 30 years. No, you serve two terms and you're out. Somebody else, you know, step to the plate. So I'm that's really on the radar, and I think it's one of the most underreported stories out there. So I'm looking forward, uh, brother, to seeing that video uh, interview you participated in on the, uh, what did you call it, states convention? The re- convention of states. We yes. got to do something. And you're right. This is, this is a very underreported, and it's likely one of the most dangerous moments in the history of this nation since, you know, the, this has never been done before. It's like it's never been done before since the 1787, I think, or somewhere along that yeah, line. Yeah, 1787. So, and it's coming into play. They've already got more than a third, and you and I have seen three states sign on just in a couple of weeks, back to back to back. I mean, and they're planning on getting it done by June. Uh, I know that there are at least two parties that have been financing this all, and they're not in agreement on what it is they want to accomplish. One has proposed as many as four amendments, and another has proposed as many as 11 amendments. And some of the amendments seem reasonable, and some of them don't make no damn sense at all to me. But right. uh, the third organization that is financing the entire thing has shoveled tens of millions of dollars into the organizers' pockets to make this happen. And they seem to not care which uh, side wins as long as there's a convention of states. And that is uh, something also that's frightening. It means like there's a a Merlin behind telling everybody what to do. You know what I mean? The guy behind the curtain. And he's just, they just want this event to occur so they can rewrite the constitution. Think about those, that sentence I just said, they want to rewrite the constitution. Now, Max, um, I'm not trying to sound like an alarmist. I'm a realist, but let's say that they were successful in, in, uh, pulling up this constitutional convention where it's only, you know, their interest that's being looked after on the inside, depending upon how, what they come up with and, and, and how that turns out, man, we could be looking at another civil war in this country. To me, it is that serious. I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm not trying to be alarmist. But I'm looking at the the people who are behind this, and I'm like, man, we may be forced into another civil war. So, people, you know, we got to be paying yep. attention to what's going on, and we got to be prepared. Yeah, it is that that bad. And, you know, it, it's not like black people have an army or Spanish people have an army or any of the minorities have an army in all of that going on. So it's basically going to be infighting between the powers that be. Uh, as it was the last time. And they're going to use us as mercenaries on both sides, just like they did last time. And we have got to play the winning hand on this one, I think. I'm doing everything I can to avoid that kind of conclusion. I think that we can can work it out. (laughs) We can work it out. But there has to be an or else. Hey, let me read something to you, Scotty, that comes from uh, Antonia Scalia, the uh, Supreme Court Justice that passed. He talked about the convention state. Uh, he, he said that there comes a point, however, at which one has to be willing to run the risk of an open convention to get to. essentially what I have said is that there is some risk of an open convention, even with respect to the limited proposal of financial responsibility at the federal level. I think that risk is worth taking. It is not much of a risk. Three quarters of the state would have to ratify whatever came out of the convention. Therefore, I don't worry about it too much. I would also be willing to run that risk for issues primarily involving the structure of the federal government and a few other so-called single issues. I would favor a convention on abortion, which some consider a single issue. I suppose slavery could have been called a single issue too. It all depends on how deeply one feels about the issue. In any case, I do not have any great fear of an open convention, since three quarters of the states do have to ratify what comes out of it. The clucking that Richard Rovere and others do about it is simply an intentional attempt to create panic and to make the whole idea sound unthinkable. 
it is not unthinkable at all. It is entirely thinkable. Well, it's good to know, even though Anton Scalia was a piece of crap, uh, it, it, it's good to know that those check, you know, check, um, checks on the power. So if they come out with something, that doesn't mean it's going to be finalized. It still has to be then ratified. So it takes three fourths to even have a constitutional convention, and then afterwards, three fourths of the states have to ratify that new constitution. Because basically, we that is what we're talking about is a new constitution. Yes. And I'm not afraid yes. of it, even though I am probably ideologically uh, opposite of Anton Scalia, who's dead now, by the way. Um, but, um, you know, um, I, I can see something positive come out of it only if we get involved in it. Right. That's how I feel about it, too. Like, we can't repeat this process. As he said, it takes years you got to get it into place. So we need to be in on this getting into play. And it's one of those things where a miracle occurs, where you can work with people who you would normally want to punch in the face. You know what I mean? Because you both got the same intentions. You think this is screwed up and you want to give the power back to the people to change the Constitution where it needs to be changed in order to accomplish that. Unfortunately, they're not thinking about us. It's not part of their mindset. So the 13th Amendment, the 6th Amendment, the 4th Amendment, the 8th Amendment, the 14th and the 15th Amendment have no airtime in their brains. For them, it's Second Amendment and First Amendment and, and you know, the uh, terms uh, limits and things like that. So if we could come together, maybe we can make something beautiful out of this. You know what I mean? You know, I've had already identified uh, potential allies in this. And that will be libertarians. Yes. Because it libertarians, like some of in the recent weeks um, that I've been reading these abolitionists in profile, they've been coming from ab uh, uh, libertarian websites. I have long followed the uh, career and the writings, and now he has his own YouTube channel of Dr. Ron Paul, who said, you know, the, he doesn't support the death penalty because it's racist. He doesn't support the drug war because it's racist. And, and so, you know, libertarians are for a limited government. And so a lot of times, though, when people hear something like that, you know, they automatically think that, you know, oh, this, a limited government, then they won't be able to protect us. And I'm saying to myself, what kind of protections you getting right now? Are not black people being shot down in the streets every 28 hours? So what government is protecting you now? Are not black people the number one targets for modern day slavery and human trafficking? So how is it? And, and it's being head. practiced by your government. So, you know, we're going to have to break through a, a lot of stereotypes and, and just be willing to sit down with people we otherwise would not. Well, you know, I was thinking we need legislators <clears throat> because a lot of this is on the, the shoulders of the legislators who have to approve these um, rat the, and ratify these amendments or changes that occur. So we need to have legislators in place with our interests in mind, which is why I'm reaching out to David Coleman, and I'm glad he's already declared himself an abolitionist and really taken it to heart, put it out in a way where he shows he believes these things. The same thing is happening in Jersey. And you and I have witnessed and talked with a number of uh, people who have run for office now on abolitionist platform at every level. You know, so right. that's what we really need to do at this point is get legislators in place. We cannot allow these alt right, right wing crazy ass so sociopaths to control everything like the sister out in um in seattle running for mayor I, wait, I gotta get her name somebody call me and tell me what her name is but she was saying you know i used to be an activist shutting all of this down and then i decided we should be taking over with these spaces instead and she ran for mayor i don't know if she won or not gotta look into it we know um um i don't know I can't recall his first name. His father passed away, um, Chokeway, uh, Lumumba Chokeway. But his son just recently, you know, he had ran for mayor and won and turned Jackson, Mississippi into one of the few human rights cities 
in the United States might have been the only one where, you know, they not looking in for civil rights or any kind of thing like that. Human rights. They're basing it off of human rights. Well, his son just won election um, uh, to become mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. And, um, you know, a lot of our brothers and sisters associated with race treaty, which comes on the network on Friday nights. Um, those are the circles that they run in as human rights defenders. I found out her name, by the way, uh, this is running out in Seattle, is Nikita Oliver. And uh, I just put a, up an article about her. She's also a poet, too. Man, so, yeah, Scotty, this is a very important thing, and I, I'm looking forward to how uh, they pull together our interview. I, I thought it went pretty smoothly, and I'm glad you're also on point with this you know, I've been talking to a few people who really don't get the gist of what I'm saying. You know what I mean? Like they don't, they don't understand, and it's really hard to get it through. But this is very important. Start from there, and work your way outwards. Um, we was talking about the governor in Jersey, by the way, too. You know, that's uh, something I, I'm feeling kind of cool about. In my home state, one of the first. I don't think we've ever had a governor uh, abolitionist. Uh, someone run on an abolitionist platform for governor, have we? Is, is this the first, Scotty, that you're aware of? It's the first that I'm aware of. We've had uh, abolitionists run for Congress. And again, just a couple of weeks ago, we had Mr. Kuma on running uh, down there in the 5th District of South Carolina for Congress, Mm -hmm. a member of the Green Party. He uh, unequivocally expressed public support on New Abolitionist Radio for abolitionism. So, but this is first I know of, Max, of a governor. Yeah, and then, of course, Senator Lena Taylor out in Wisconsin, who uh, has been putting legislation forward to get the exception clause out of the state constitution there. So we have senators who have a... She's not the only one either. I can't think of the other person's name right now. Um, We have met every level. um, Now that you mention that, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe they tried and it failed, but I want to say it was successful in Colorado to remove the exception clause from their constitution. No, no, it wasn't. They missed by just a few votes. I think it was like three million votes, and they, and they missed by just a few of them. Um, they say that the loss, they weren't able to get it out with the initiative, uh, and it was because of the propaganda that was being put out by the prison companies, basically saying that these people wanted to free all the prisoners. And, you know, in Colorado, they have some of the most uh, maximum security prisons on earth there they have huge clusters of them towns and nothing see, but prison towns in colorado see in max places you know this is why i say to people when i'm asked the question well you know what does it take to be an abolitionist well as little as convincing your neighbors to be uh, abolitionists and explaining the issues to them because we know that the private prison slavers and and you know the politicians that that support slavery through the prisons we know they're going to come out with their propaganda and going to tell lies and things of that nature so this is why public education is very important this is why this program is very important and I'm very proud to have been a part of it for the past five years but we cannot we cannot uh, uh, minimize the importance of face to face conversations about abolitionism and modern day slavery with our neighbors. Yeah, it's it's so hard sometimes to get through to people. You know what I mean? I was asked that in the interview yesterday. How does one become an abolitionist? And you know, it's kind of it, it's a real question, but. <laughs> It's just a state. It really, it's a state of mind. You know, think of your ancestors, and they were being beaten, and, and they couldn't do the things they wanted to do, or being abused. And, and somebody said, "Hey, how do you become an abolitionist?" To them, they're like, "What? Like, I just want to be free. I know this is slavery, and I'm not calling it something else. I'm not saying I can fix this because it's not a crime. I'm saying this is a crime, and it needs to stop." And that's abolitionist and abolitionism. You're looking at this whole thing as slavery, not as mass incarceration, not as policing for profit, not as the war industrial complex, not as the prison industrial complex, not as any of these different scenarios put together. Those are all symptoms 
of a much broader, older, larger, and more demonic being than what you're talking about there. It's about slavery. All those things exist in slavery, all of them. And we could fight each of them individually, but you got to have, at least in your mind, that we all agree what the problem is. Slavery. That's an abolitionist, as far as I'm concerned. And to abolish it means to put into place laws that prevent it from being practiced under any form, in any guise. Like that's the UN. the abolitionist perspective when it comes to law. Yeah, like the UN Charter says on human rights, that uh, slavery and involuntary servitude shall be abolished in all its forms. No exceptions. Right. Don't come at me with this hustle of how you don't found a new trick because of the cancerous influence of for-profit private prisons that showed our federal and state prisons how to really exploit arresting people. <laughs> how to really just criminalize people, throw drugs at them, put poverty in their in their way, you know, just force them into bad situations and then collect them like you're shopping at a Walmart. Put them into these cells and get that money for everybody that you put there. You know, we even reported in about the story in Texas, for instance, where they were charging people for arrests, whether you were proven guilty or not. Just if you came in the booking, it cost you like $25. And then they were running low on money for the, uh, I guess, for the sheriff's office. So they wrote an email back and forth talking about how they were going to raise the cost of the arrest, the, the processing fees, in order to make up the loss that they were having. So they were going for like 25 to $40. So if they stop you for any reason, when you go to the booking place, to the police station in this city in Texas, you got to pay this 25 or $40 or whatever it may be, whether you're guilty or not. And it's not refundable. So if they need money, guess what they could do? $40, $40, $40. Arrest 30, 40, 50, 60 people a night. You, that's a lot of $40. Hey, this story just came out this week pertaining to my own state, and I did not even know this, but again, I've never really been in this situation to where I would know, and I haven't heard anybody that I know talk about it. But the ACLU put out a piece this week here in North Carolina and said that that they're using money you owe the courts for your fines and stuff like that. They're using that to stop you from voting. They they have taken away people's voting rights if they owe money to the state in, in court fines. Yeah. Not if you owe taxes, okay, like you behind on your property taxes or you didn't pay the taxes on your vehicles and things of that nature. No, if you owe court fines, if you're on probation and you are have not paid back, you know, because don't them guys have to pay for their probation? If you didn't pay for your community service, you can't vote. To me, what's the difference between between that and a poll tax? That's woefully unconstitutional. I was just made aware of it this week. But this is the stuff that's happening across this nation, people, that the mainstream media is not telling you about. And you have to really, really, you know, just, you, you really have to be paying attention. You have to seek information out. You can't just wait for it to come to you through, you know, your television. This is it. We got the internet now, and it's under assault right now with the new FCC chairman uh, that Donald Trump appointed. Um, but, you know, it's a lot of stuff that's going on, and, and, and it just... It's just shameful that so many people think that, oh, this is the land of of liberty and freedom. And it could be nothing further from the truth. You know, I want to continue on that story about the governor in Jersey and and show a, a few connections here so people can see, again, the bigger picture. So Jersey and Mississippi is on my scope today about putting things together. I want to read part of the art of the gubernatorial candidate, and it's from uh, rawstory.com says a candidate for New Jersey governor said this week that corporate for-profit prisons are how the United States maintains its legacy of slavery without consequences or censure from the rest of the world. According to Salon.com 2017 Democratic gubernatorial candidate Bill Brennan, a retired firefighter known for his direct 
plain spoken style said at a candidate forum this week that the U.S. prison system exploits the labor of people of color just like the transatlantic slave trade did for 400 years. We have a Jim Crow system that carries forward, Brennan said. We can connect today's incarceration nation directly back to slavery. It is exactly the reason they're doing it. We had least labor after Reconstruction. And what was that? Put black people in jail, make them work, lease them out to their former owners. And what are we doing today? We have the Corrections Corporations of America, for now known as uh, Corps, Civ Corps, Civic Corps. Is it Civic Corps, Scotty? Corps Civic, Corps Civic. We have uh, Corrections Corporation of America, now known as Corps Civic, making money on our misery. And this has got to stop. He continued before asserting that U.S. prosperity was built on two things, the genocide of Native Americans and the enslavement of African Americans. How clear can a brother say it? You know what I mean? Like, yes. Like, how clear can you say it? You wow. found it doubted. Now, I have a question, and it's not that I because, you know, I'm not a partisan guy. You know, I don't care if a person's a Republican, Libertarian, Green Party, or what. I'm looking at your ideals. I'm looking at, and more importantly, your solutions. But what party is this guy with? Democratic. He's That's running as Democrat. Now, I'm going to say that is big coming from a member of the establishment party because I look at Republicans and Democrats as to uh you know different wings on the same bird and so what this represents though is abolitionism being pushed into the democratic party and and mm -hmm. you know and like you mentioned it a governor do you know how much weight that carries if we can if this guy can get elected man it, it yeah he was right on point Somebody's been educating Word. him well, or he's been educating himself on the issue. You know, and then there's a second story that's tied into this where he says, uh, and he comes from Wayne, New Jersey, by the way. Uh, it's right out, I mean, wasn't that far from where I grew up. Anyway, uh, I'm going to read this one. comes from 12 News. Wayne activist Bill Brennan is moving forward with plans to criminally prosecute Governor Chris Christie over the Bridgegate scandal while also announcing his intent to run for governor. Um, so ba basically, he's looking as one of the first things he's going to do is send Chris Christie to jail for the Bridgegate scandal. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on the Bridgegate scandal. You could Google that and look it all up. But it was some criminal activities going on that he okayed Chris Christie. But that's not the worst of what he's been dealing with. And this is something that I'm going to need to reach out to uh, Bill Brennan and bring to his uh, attention. And that's Chris Christie's ties to the private prisons. That is the, the crimes against humanity that this sitting governor is uh, putting upon the, the citizens of his state. You know, Chris Christie uh, was prosecutor and he was also a lobbyist for a private prison company by the name of CEC and having as well as ties with ICE and contracts with ICE. Uh, we've talked to people here who have uh, explained to us that they knew the people who started CEC and the reasons they started uh, CEC. In any case, his connections include lawsuits for uh, constitutional violations on inmates and things like that. So I've got this information here. I put it on New Abolitionist Radio. I'm going to try to get it to this potential governor so he can use this. It's not the Bridgegate scandal that's going to put Chris Christie under the microscope. It's his relationship to the prisons and how he used the juvenile detention facilities of CEC across all of New Jersey to the point where it started, they started using eminent domain laws to take up property. And then that business model was expanded till it came here to South Carolina where I was visiting one of their facilities here in South Carolina because that business model was expanded. Now let me tell you what else he did and I know this from speaking from interviewing Ed Fortune also known as the New Jersey weed man um, who actually won his case uh, when they busted him with a pound of pot 
which he, you know, uh, was from California, and he had a doctor's, you know, prescription for pot, but he, he, his hometown is in New Jersey, but he has a bone cancer, and that's what he smokes to alleviate the pain, and we know California had, um, has medical uh, uh, cannabis, but New Jersey, actually, the voters passed uh, medical cannabis in New Jersey, but but Chris Christie refuses to implement it. Why? Well, Max just told you about his connection to people who are profiting off of keeping stuff illegal or prohibited. And so that's another thing that uh, Chris Christie has done. He has ignored the will of voters. And I don't know because I haven't looked it up uh, recently. But as far as I know, New Jersey still doesn't have medicinal marijuana. You know, Scotty, just looking at it on a monetary level, remember we was talking about how um, the GEO group was getting these 1,000 men and it was worth $44 million a year for them, for the 1,000 men in contracts? Yes. Well, that 1,000 men were adults, and they're being housed at adult prices, which is somewhere between forty to $90,000 a year, depending on what state you're in. The children are much, much more. Right. In New Jersey, it's over two hundred thousand dollars a year to house one of uh, one child, one teenager in a facility for one single year in these for-profit institutions. So, if you got a thousand kids, you're making a lot more than forty-four million dollars. That's for sure. Wow. Mm-mm-mm. This is just, I mean, I. How do these people, well, I understand, man. You know, some people, they are just immoral, man. They're just literal, literally monsters. I just can't prey on other individuals, especially children. Especially children. And then they'll always be the ones that be like, you know, what about the children? What about the children? And then they're invested in companies or work for companies that are enslaving children and making hundreds of thousands of dollars per child. It's it, Man, it's just so sick. And I remember you, you know, when we were fo- looking at the Khalif Browder story, New York is another state where, you know, it's an exorbitant amount of money uh, for to house children. So that's why Khalif Browder will spend three years in Riker without being convicted of anything. Yeah, he was generating an income. Uh, he, by himself, just his body, being in that place, was making sure that some people stayed employed. Sick, man. Hmm. So uh, all of this information that we talk about here on New Abolitionist Radio is always available on the webpage. We try to put them on there so you can go ahead and get those links and check them out for yourself if you want to research further or further or get the whole story. Uh, and some of it we just talk about because it's just too too much to talk about. Like, I can't express <clears throat> to you how important it is for you to watch time the Khalif Browder story so you can see his whole story unfold. And then you think of Khalif and you multiply him time many thousands across this country. Well, well, Max... Um... I'm trying to multitask here. Um, I need to get some stuff uh, for the next program um, for Mind, Body, and Spirit. So if you can lead us into the next story, and once I get caught up, you know, I'll uh, read some of the other stories as well. Apologies, man. I'm just behind the day because of this system. It's just running slow. Okay, okay, I can do that. So uh, take what time you need. And what I'll do is I'll start on the Mississippi stories. Uh, How about that? So we just got one uh, came in recently from the Washington Post, and this is from May 9th. Oh, oh, hold on. Stop the press. There is one thing I meant to do in the very beginning, and I very I forgot all about it, and that's wish my oldest son a happy birthday. Happy Yesterday birthday. Yesterday was his birthday. Indeed. Son number one, man. He's in his 30s now. Wow. And he's a lot like his dad, very creative. Man, Probably I would never me. think that you and uh, have a child that old man <laughs> yeah I'm my old as dirt and twice as gritty brother <laughs> but yeah okay there you go so now on to the Mississippi story happy birthday son on to the Mississippi story uh, this comes out of the Washington Post and the headlines say 
black people in a Mississippi county are under a permanent state of siege, according to an ACLU lawsuit. Now, mind you, before I say to start reading the story, that these are the things we've been pushing the ACLU to do, to finally put this on your priority list because it's happening in every state across America, not just in Mississippi or in Alabama or in Louisiana, but everywhere. We have proven that with our America is Ferguson series, with the research to back it up. Anyway, it starts with this. It was 7 a.m. last June when six sheriff's deputies stormed into the Manning family home in Canton, Mississippi, according to a new lawsuit. They demanded that the Manning sign witness statements for a crime in their neighborhood they claim not to have seen. When Qaddafi Manning, 35, refused deputies allegedly handcuffed, choked and beat the man, who uses a cane because of a nerve condition. They called him Mr. Cripple, his wife said, and proceeded to drag him out of the house, down the stairs, and into a patrol car, beating him until he wrote a witness statement. Qaddafi and Quinetta Manning are among those suing the Sheriff's Department in Madison County, claiming the department uses used unconstitutional checkpoints unlawful searches of homes and excessive force as part of what they call a coordinated top-down program to illegally target black residents. The lawsuit filed Monday by American Civil Liberties uh, Union of Mississippi seeks a court order to stop the Sheriff's Department from using such tactics. It also asks that a civilian board review complaints against the department. Ten black residents, men and women, 27 to 62 are plaintiffs in the case. Some black residents are so afraid of being pulled over or stopped at a checkpoint that they are avoiding leaving their homes, the lawsuit says. In effect, the policing program has placed the black community of Madison County under a permanent state of siege, the lawsuit states. Sheriff Randy Tucker, who is white and has been in office since 2012, would not immediately comment uh, Monday because he had not seen the lawsuit. Spokesman Heath Hall told the Associated Press for decades, and this is the last part of it I want to read and then move on to the next one. For decades, black people in Madison County have been dealing with the constant barrage by the Madison County Sheriff's Department. ACL Mississippi Executive Director Jennifer Riley Collins said at a news conference Monday at the ACLU office in Jackson. Roughly 57% of Madison County residents are white, and about 38% are black. The most recent census estimates show that home to about 105,000 people, it ranks as the wealthiest county in Mississippi per capita income in 2015 was just shy of 60 grand, according to the State Department of Employment Security. The county wealth it's concentrated among its white residents, according to the complaint. In the city of Madison, which is 85% white, the average household income is double the average income for, for Canton, the county's largest majority black city, the lawsuit says. The ACLU argues the county has harbored a long history of racial animus towards its man. Is that how you explain Mississippi? Goddamn! <laughs> has harbored a long history history of racial animus towards his black residents. It notes that a previous sheriff was on the board of a citizens group that opposed desegregation in the 50s and says the other authorities had used racially discriminatory policing tactics. Well, you can read the rest of New Abolitionist Radio. Well, make sure it's up there. But you can see what's happening. It's gotten to the point now. They got spot checks and... and checkpoints like it's freaking Nazi Germany and they're just stopping black people and making this money on ticketing them and fining them and then they use these warrants where you know they could just break into your house because you didn't pay the ticket you didn't know you had or because you couldn't afford it to begin with uh, using the cash bail systems right. all these different ways of just draining you dry and using your very life as the energy of their economic survival well, you know, we certainly could put together uh, Mississippi is Ferguson or whatever the name of this little town is. But it sounds to me no, it's, we have. it's worse than Ferguson is what it sounds yeah, like to have, me. We have done Mississippi is Ferguson. Somewhere during the night tonight, maybe when you're doing uh, uh, telling us about what's going on with the FBI director and things like that, I'll find our Mississippi is Ferguson and share it with everybody. 
Yeah, but, uh, but there's that story. Well, Max, let let me. I shared that story on social media um, earlier today, and you know, I sometimes I don't pay attention to the comments, but I will peruse the comments just to see what people thinking. And I'm never, uh, I'm never disappointed. But there will be those people with that racial animus. Now, if it had said something like, if it didn't even mention the skin color of the victims, I wonder how these people would react. You know, did they talk? You know, I would like to do an article like that where you don't even mention the skin color, and I bet you these. Or if you say these were white people or or whatever. Some of the comments like saying, I don't believe it. Without it, and you know they don't read the article. I don't believe it. They see the name ACLU. A lot of people program because they see it as a liberal organization. They program to automatically be against something they're doing. And I'm like, but then you want to say, you know, we're all Americans. Then why you don't stand up for your fellow Americans' constitutional rights if you want to say we all Americans? But no, that is not your mindset your mindset is to look at the skin color of the victims and then side with the with the police state so you know those are my comments before i get to ranting on those people uh brother you know that's what we're here for is to uh make people aware of these circumstances and the immediate danger the clear and present danger and to clarify the issue you know, like, so people know what we're dealing with here. This is slavery and human trafficking. You ain't, it ain't nothing wrong with you. You're not a freaking criminal. There's not, how did, uh, what's his name? Uh, the dude that just did the uh, thing on race. Charles Barkley say, say about Black Lives Matter, just a bunch of thugs. And we got a lot of criminals in our community. I it's did not, not even watch sad. that garbage, Max. Uh, Charles Barkley, we know where he is, so... You know, he wanted to be the governor of Alabama. Ain't nothing wrong with you. The problem is this system is an extension and the evolution of what was chattel slavery. And instead of being born a slave now, you're born in a hunting ground where at any moment your lottery ticket might get picked. And the ch- the number of lottery tickets you have is really based on a number of factors, starting with race and class and education and location. And all of these things add up. And the, the higher your percentage chance, guess what? Boom. That's why I said, brother, I'm, I'm scared to death about when my son comes out next month after spending his entire adult life in prison there's nearly a three-quarter chance that he is going to go back. I'm thinking percentages, and how do I reduce those percentages? <laughs> well, you have Man. to use spiritual principles and, and, and speak words of power. He is not going back. We're going to declare that right now. He is not going back. Yeah, well, those words of power uh, often have to be spoken at times where you see uh, these obstacles, collateral consequences come to play. I mean, he ain't even got out the door yet, and I'm already getting the shaft. I talked to his transfer PO here in South Carolina from New Jersey, and the dude told me, look, I'm going on vacation. I'll be back in a couple of weeks. We can talk about it then. I'm like, doesn't this have to be through 45 days in advance before he gets out? We got to get this transfer done? I, I, well, I'm not going to think about it right now. I'm going on vacation. I'm like, are you serious, dude? You, do you realize you're talking to a father who has not held his son in 17 freaking years and is finally getting out since he was a child and that this is how you want to deal with me, right? So yeah, if that's how it begins, it's going to be a horror story. I hear you. Somebody like somebody like that would lock him up if they just from the statement of saying, you know what, I smell weed on your clothes. I know it ain't nothing in your bloodstream, but you smell like weed, so we're going to violate you and send you back. That's how these fools do. Some of the things I'm thinking right now I cannot say publicly, so I'll just be quiet. Well, I ranted like you did, Scotty. Pardon me, audience. I appreciate you dealing with the ranters here sometimes we need <laughs> Johanan to come in and mellow us out somewhere <laughs> oh yeah um, but, uh, I spoke to Johanan and Johanan is just dealing with some financial issues and he's working a lot of overtime 
uh, but I almost forgot, you know, um, he just says hello, you know, to the abolitionists. He'll be back as soon as he can. He just needs to work that overtime, you know, because he's trying to survive behind these enemy lines like the rest of us. Word, man, word. So I guess with all of that ranting about what's going on in Mississippi, um, there's several other stories that came. We can go. I'm not going to read them all, but you can see how they all tie together. We were just talking about, you know, how uh, Mississippians, Black Mississippians, are in a constant state of siege. The other one explains about how they are using these checkpoints to enforce segregation. And then, uh, you know, there's another one that comes from the Guardian, where they talk about how they use uh, this to exploit the poor again with the tickets and the fines and the warrants and the arrests and all these things that create someone's paycheck but the cherry on the top is what we've been talking about now here since 2014 uh yeah about 2014 so past three years we've been following the story of the entire state of mississippi's prison system uh commissioner the longest running commissioner in the history of that state prison commissioner christopher epps and how corrupt he was to the point where they were about to give him 268 years in jail for corruption. Him, uh, along with his cohorts, working within the legislature, working within private business, business, working with private prisons, were all using these no-bid contracts and supplier trade tricks to the point where the commissioner was recorded going to five or six different banks within a one hour period depositing nine thousand nine hundred and some odd dollars just to stay out of the ten thousand dollar limit and he did this like in an hour with six banks and this was his regular process he had already got a uh, I believe he had got a house out of the deal as part of trade in and he was working on a second one trying to force these people to give him more things for his trickery and at the point that he was doing all of this. They had this organization. Uh, it's the American Prison Association. Or AP, I think it's APA, but if it's not, somebody will correct me. In any case, their duty is to monitor the prisons and make sure that they're adhering to certain governmental requirements or state requirements, right? For humanity purposes, I mean, human rights at least. Apparently, he was the president of this company. And while he was the president, he was writing himself 100% ratings and then bragging about it. He was giving himself awards for his prisons in Mississippi as the president of this institution that was meant to oversee the prisons and make sure that they were uh, maintaining their obligations for human rights, civil rights, uh, citizen rights, whatever it may be. So he was hustling that. And while he was doing that, Federal judges were investigating the youth detention facilities in Mississippi. I think it was Walnut Grove. And they came out of there saying, quote, this is a cesspool of unconstitutional violations. That's what the federal judges said about Mississippi's juvenile detention facilities. Now imagine what they were doing to the adults while this dude was lying about how good the prisons were and bragging about it and giving himself awards, he was exploiting the citizens in order to get this money for himself, McCrory, the doctors, the private companies, and just splitting it amongst each other at the cost of people's lives. Now, nobody has been freed behind this yet. I don't even think they're looking at the whole picture at this point. But here on New Abolitionist Radio, you got it today. All of this information is available on our page there on Facebook including the uh, whole discussion about the prisons in Mississippi and Christopher Epp on a Rachel Maddow presentation. You know, Max, um, I kind of feel like in in cases like this, he not being punished for his role in modern-day slavery and human trafficking in Mississippi. He being punished for exposing it through his big mouth. That's what I feel like. That's what he being punished for. If he'd have just kept his mouth shut and, and wasn't bragging and running his mouth and just do what a lot of them do and keeping it under under the table, under wraps and things of that nature, then he would have been good. But he got busted and it exposed him to liabilities. 
That's what they're mad about. Well, it's one of those things that we want congressional hearings on at the uh, when we do the Millions for Prisoners March on Washington. This is one of our demands. This issue right here needs to be talked about. We need to find out just how deep this is and how bad it is because we know that Christopher Epps has been turning state evidence. And now we've had doctors who have admitted they have paid off sheriffs They've been paying off the sheriffs so they can get the you know the accounts for the prisoners and stuff like that. So there's a lot going on here, and it may reach as high as the governor or even more, uh, who are making money off the black bodies. Of course, they're hitting not just black, but primarily black bodies in Mississippi. And this is a model that's repeated all across America. We keep, we keep trying to tell you this, that is not just Mississippi, just like it wasn't those two judges in Pennsylvania who were selling kids Uh, through the kids for cash scandals not just Pennsylvania those are just the ones you busted Andy Dukin is just the one you caught right well we're about three minutes out of our first break Scotty when we uh, we want to take it early and then we come back I would like for you to tell us what's going on with the FBI director Because the FBI has a direct effect on modern day slavery and human trafficking. So how does that play into the abolitionist movement? And um, I would like to hear, because I know know you've been doing a lot of research and I see you put out a lot of, uh, at least two or three videos on the subject. So yeah, break it down to us. In the meantime, you're listening to New Abolitionist Radio with Scotty Reed and Max Parker. We're talking about modern day slavery and human trafficking and we'll be right back after these messages. You are tuned in to the Black Talk Radio Network for podcasts and live program scheduling. Visit us on the web at blacktalkradionetwork.com. Peace and welcome back to New Abolitionist Radio. If you've got a question or a comment, you can just press star star if you're already signed on in Uber conference call, and that will unmute you, or you can call us at 866-510-9025. And uh, just, uh, we'll... Well, how do you get on from that, Scotty? Is there something we got to press? After star, they star. Call the number. Just hit star, star. star, star to call the, the number two. Yeah, right. yeah. After so, they yeah, call, just press star, star, and that will unmute you. Yeah, that'll let unmute you. That way, I'll see you on the board and know that you have a question or uh, comment. Uh, before we move on, though, I, I just want to acknowledge a comment that's in the com- in the conference room uh, uh, um, chat box. Um, and so we have a person who's saying that the international workers of the world, I believe, is is what that is. That I and we've interviewed yes. people yes. like that before. Incarcerated um, workers, but they're in Asheville. They are thinking about running a candidate for local office there. And I'm saying, go for it. Go for it. You know. Uh, yeah. And, go for it. Yeah. You know, we we got to attack this on every level by any means necessary, death by a thousand paper cuts, and we need to run abolitionist candidates all across, not only, as we talked about with David uh, Kuma, uh, the Green Party is an international party, okay? So we need to be running abolitionist candidates across the world, across the planet, because it is a global right. issue. right. Like uh, the sister out in Seattle said, you know, we used to shut these spot places down, and then we decided, you know what, we should really be taking these over, and you should. We need to take these positions over. No. So yeah, man, uh, politics. You know, Scotty, when you first met me here and I started on this show, I was like very anti-political. Remember, like I am not working with no pop. I will never ever trust any politician, not any of the time. And I haven't changed that feeling much, but I have crossed the boundaries and worked with these brothers and sisters on a regular basis, whether it be helping to advance the education on modern day slavery and human trafficking, or even stumping for them. Because as far as I'm concerned, if you're an abolitionist and you're in office, you're the beginning of change. Right. Death by our 
saying that I started saying years ago. You know, when you was making it known, hey, I'm an anarchist. You know, I don't believe in electoral politics or anything. And I was like, you know, well, Max, we can look at it death through a thousand paper cuts. And like Malcolm X said it so succinctly, you know, by any means necessary. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you are betraying your principles. It just means that you're using an avenue that's available as a tool to end slavery. And that's the goal there. That is the goal. That's the overall goal. Every aspect of the abolitionist movement has to be in play. Every aspect of it. This is why we've been doing our best to identify these different aspects of the uh, modern slavery uh, fight for, to end slavery, like the riders of the 21st century Underground Railroad. We literally have an Underground Railroad. The Innocence Project is the ab- are the abolitionists on the train getting these people out of these cages and putting them back into the sunlight. Like, literally. You know? And when we say every part of it, I mean, just for example, tonight our uh, what we're remembering of the rebellions is Nat Turner. And then we're also honoring, as our abolitionist in profile, John Brown. Neither one of those were politicians. Right. Right. And both were very religious. Very religious. But you know, this we're talking about slavery people. We're not talking about high taxes. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're not right. talking about legalizing marijuana. That's not the primary concern. We're talking about slavery and freedom. Two really, really important principles. Right. that we build everything we know on. Right. You either have it or you don't. Right. Well, man. So, Max, yeah. Uh, and, go ahead, Scotty. You no, know, um, I'm trying to grasp what you want me to speak about in terms of James Comey um, because the context, it was a political context, those videos that I made in my analysis, uh, you know, I don't really see how I can can translate that into abolitionism except for my criticism or not my criticism but me saying that don't feel sorry for James Comey if he got fired he got fired they ain't this the same dude that put a side of Shakur on the FBI's most wanted list you know so don't shed no tears for Comey uh, Comey is a slaver and, you know, the FBI put out um, a report in 2006 about the infiltration of law enforcement by white supremacist terrorists, or I will say white savage terrorists. Um, how many uh, investigations has Comey talked about or led or, you know, arrested and prosecuted? You know, I don't know. No, no, no. They've been protecting those people and protect because they redacted the names. They identified some well-known people who they felt like were ghost skins. Ghost skins are people who belong to white supremacist terrorist groups, but they don't have all the tattoos and the markings and stuff to where you can identify them. You know, they, they, they call them ghost skins. And, it, and the FBI redacted those names in that report. And, and I believe one of them was Rudy Giuliani. I can't prove it, but from what I was reading in the report, that's who I think it is they were talking about. And and so, you know, I was just saying, don't feel sorry for Comey. So I, I don't know if that's what you wanted me to speak on. If there's something else, I'll do my best. No, you're kind of bringing it together. I just want to understand because, you know, the FBI uh, could be involved with us as allies in ending slavery if they freaking recognized it, but instead they're participating in it and continuing it to the right. point where they are really the enemy of the people. So, yeah, if Comey's gone, it's because he was never no ally of ours anyway. And if the next person comes in line and, you know, maybe he starts spouting out things that you would hear from Jan Mickelson's mouth, well what else is new? I mean, best I understand, the FBI actually began with the Ku Klux Klan, didn't it? Yeah, and when Jeff Sessions somebody gave, can educate me on that. And when Jeff Sessions came out after he was confirmed as the U.S. Attorney General over there at the Department of, the Ju- of Justice, which works, you know, very closely with the FBI, I think the FBI might actually be under the Department of Justice, but don't quote me on that. But 
when Jeff Sessions uh, had that convention of state attorney generals and said, hey, we're not going to spend any money investigating these police shootings for civil rights violations or constitutional violations. We're not going to tell slave catchers how to do their jobs. Well, I didn't hear Robert Comey come out and say anything against that. So, you know, uh, I don't feel so. I like it when the system cannibalizes itself. When when these people go to war, go to civil war uh, among themselves, well, you know, that just means that they'll be weaker. Exactly, Scotty. <laughs> I love it when a plan comes together. So, yeah, this is them heading towards the civil war like we said earlier on it's not us gonna be going charging to the fore with freaking artillery and aircraft these people in power right now are about to go war with each other and they have allies within the military and the air force and the navy who are going to take sides and the, the you know the national guard and somebody's going to be in charge and somebody's going to pick whose side they're going to be on that's where they're heading at right now I'm going to be doing a lot of ducking. That's me, like, ducking and weaving and dodging. <laughs> I'm out here in the middle of nowhere I'm a, I, where I can eat natural foods and fish in the water, you know? But anyway, Scotty, man, uh, that's a hell of a thing going on right now, man. Like you said, let them cannibalize each other. That's normally how evil ends up, by eating itself. Speaking of evil, evil, there is another story that I want to share, and today we seem to have a little bit of time for it. So, there's a story that Max, came out. I'm sorry, from May 8th. Max, and- I had myself muted. I'm sorry, um, but let me say this: I'm looking at, you know, mainstream media. I don't watch it, but I do monitor it. And I past 48 hours, James Comey, Russia, Trump, James Comey, Russia, Trump. And as we open up the program talking about, well, what about Texas becoming the 11th state recently to sign on to this constitutional convention? I'm looking at it as a distraction. It's possible either a distraction from that or a distraction from the fact that a tunnel in a nuclear power plant or where they keep the uh, nuclear waste, millions of tons of it, apparently, you know, collapsed and they had to evacuate the surrounding area. It, mm. That sounds like a very dangerous situation. Max, Could we got a call. from that, too. We have a Did caller. you say we have a caller? Yes, area code 757. Mm. Thank you for joining us here on New Abolitionist Radio. If you don't mind stating your name, uh, go ahead with your question and comment. Oh, get out of here, man. What's up, my brothers? You know who this is. Hey, what's going on, Otis? Otis. Hey, look, as a matter of fact, you asked asked you about what comes under the Department of Justice. I tell you, you know, I tell you, I I got nothing to do but sit around and read. There's actually 60 different departments under the Department of Justice, and I'm going to run off a quick one for you so you get where it comes from. Got Civil Division, Civil Rights Division, Federal Bureau of Prisons, Federal Bureau of Prisons. Bureau of Investigation, Justice Management, National Commission on Forensic Science, the same people that overlooked your girl who who, uh, worked for the state, they ultimately had a federal jurisdiction over that bad lab. Office for Access to Justice, the same people that ain't taking care of, of these states and enforcing no punishment on them for not funding public defenders, which is directly a part of your constitutional right. National Criminal Justice Center, National Institute of Corrections. In other words, everything you're talking about is actually controlled by them. <laughs> everything. Yep. It, it's That's all. all. Bureau of Prisons, Management of the Bureau of Prisons, uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Attorney, uh, all the U.S. attorneys all across the nation. None of these people are doing their job when it comes to protecting the public. And when you start talking about politics, I keep trying to think, I'm 63, so I've I've been trying to brainstorm over what to do to get young people hip to this stuff. And I actually been crashing a lot of people's Facebook pages and and having them come back to me on on, uh, private messages because I just can't have no patience for the foolishness no more. I keep telling these people, I'm okay with you having your opinion, but when you come into the public, I don't care whether it's Facebook, 
or at your public meeting, when you open your mouth and it's not backed by data and facts, just like your program is, if it's not backed by data and all you want to do is tell me you got an opinion, I'm going to be in your face. And insulting me with your mouth don't matter. I want the listeners and the people to make a conscious decision based on facts. And, and, and school systems nor churches are giving these people the basic tools to understand how you can change the system. School boards, local, I heard Scotty touch on it. You can't do anything in this country anymore without politics because the law is no longer in your favor. The, the, you, you, you can't even go. Discrimination suits, unemployment risks, you can't do any of that as an individual anymore. All oh, that's been changed since the Reagan era. Everything has to be class action. What's that do? Puts you in with a bunch of lawyers. In other words, you get only the justice you can afford. Poor people can't do that unless they do it in mass or do what you were hitting on before I, I buzzed in, take over the local process. So then once you disrupt the local process, that's when you can disrupt the state and the federal because they don't have feeder fish. They're training these people up. Like Kane, who was picked for Hillary's uh, uh, vice president. That man came to the system here in Virginia as a mayor in Richmond after he volunteered a lot and worked in the, in the black neighborhood the same way he did when he was working as a missionary in South America, which you already know means he's probably a plant collecting information for the CIA. Here's what I show you how white people work. Kane's wife is a daughter of a racist governor from the early history of Virginia. These people keep all the power in their families. Max, when I mean, you don't Otis. know the limit connection, you get lost. Oh, there's something you touched upon. So I, I want to share a personal story from North Carolina here. When you said that they train these people up, they get they get them in high school, the young or in college, young talking. Republicans, young Democrats, and what about young abolitionists? We need to do, man. We got that's a lot of I'm work to about. do. That's, and, that's what we got to do. Yeah, gotta and get these young minds that that whose parents or either like like uh, Max was talking about, teaching them how not to hold their parents guilty over being caught up by a slave catcher. So they do everything they can to make sure they don't go back. You're going to lose some, but if you get that family bond back together and make sure they understand how we've been disrupted, then we can build abolitionists because they keep talking about it's personal, you know, somebody didn't make the right decision. They could have avoided it. No. Right. Just like that town that you're talking about with the, with the uh, roadblocks. That's happening all over this country based on Alex. You can go to Alex's website, but you might not be able to do it now, but there's another lady who tracks them. But you can go and find out. These practices that these small towns are doing, that's the same thing they learn at these law, law enforcement conventions and stuff. I lived in Dallas working at the convention center, going to some of this stuff and listening to these people before they started blocking public out, you know, working nighttime jobs, cleaning up and ushering and stuff. That's what they do. They bring in these people in these conventions, sit down and tell them what you should do, and you look up, the same procedures are going on in every town, and the bad part about it is the person will come back to your town and tell you like it's their bright idea. You know, um, and, and they're taught how to sell it to you. But we going, need to use that same strategy. But get going back to how you know they recruit and train these young people to follow in their footsteps. The local congressman over this district, um, his name is Patrick McHenry. He's a Republican. And so they come out. He went to a private college that's in, in Belmont, which is the next city over um, um, from uh, the city that I live close to, or little town, I should say. Um, he went to Belmont Abbey College. It's a private college. All right, so he gonna come out with this. Um, I forget what they call it. What do they call it? Where they let young people come in and and work on the staff or internship? Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, mentoring and internship. Yeah. yeah, and so he gonna make it available to students at his alma mater. This is a private college, 
Now, because I pay attention to local politics as well as I pay attention to any other politics, I contacted him and I said, how dare you? You're going to use public funds to offer an uh, uh, internship to somebody at a private college and their parents more than likely can afford to pay for it if they can afford to go to Belmont Abbey. But you're using public money to give to a private college to benefit their students. I said, what about Gaston College, which I didn't graduate from Gaston College, but I've taken courses up there. That's the public college, community college. I said, how are you not going to offer it to the people that go to Gaston College. And then uh, not a month later, he offered another internship program for Gaston College students. So I'm, I'm just saying we got to be involved. We got to be engaged. We got to speak up or they just going to continue to do what they've always done. And, look, and I'm saying to you, I, I keep trying to figure out how do you get like, like these churches and stuff. I talk to people all the time, and they look at me like I'm crazy, and I'm saying, you're not understanding how it's connected. These things aren't accidental. As a matter of fact, I just uh, finished bombarding some young people out of Washington, D.C. on Facebook. I just crashed their thread because they're talking all this ignorant stuff about LBJ is a racist. And I don't know. Which president wasn't a racist? I tell you, you're getting mixed up. I mean, I'm like Malcolm X. I don't care about a racist individual. What I care about is since 1960, I ain't even talking about 1800s, since 1930, through the, uh, Roosevelt, Eisenhower, and all of them, they even used the interstates to displace 40,000 black families a year just creating the interstate. A conscious decision. So I keep telling them, the force of government, white suppression, is what the problem is. People, there's no such thing as personal responsibility when the weight of the government is steady on your butt, just like those people in that small town. Now, can you imagine you're in a small town and you can't even go out and traverse around the town without a roadblock that's picking you up? That, that's, that's insane. It's a police state. But it's, it's happening all over the country. You can't even get church members and stuff to understand it. You know what they tell them? If you ain't doing nothing wrong, what difference it make? You dummy. You seeing people getting killed every day that did nothing wrong, and you can't figure it out? Right. We just had a young boy, 15 years old, have his brains blown out as he was driving away, and he wasn't even driving the car. And his brother had to witness it, you know, as this oh, yeah. policeman used a rifle on a car moving away that hadn't been doing anything. Innocent children but, and blew his brains out. But yeah. I guess you're thinking... If he, he must have did something wrong, right? <laughs> right. And I'm telling you, I did, to show you how funny my life has been, I've been blessed. I ain't got a lot of money, but I've been blessed. I actually put up four by four swing sets for a company called Yards of Fun. In that whole North Texas area, I bid the whole contract, and I did North Texas and Oklahoma for about four years. I've been all through the neighborhood. You know what happened? What I used to make, get on the phone, deal with the people, have the swing set sent to my garage, I pre-assembled parts of them, put them on my truck, had a 69 Ford truck set up with racks and everything, cover these things in cloth, take it to the people's house. They couldn't tell I was black over the phone, so I pull up to the house, I literally had people call the police and stand at their front door, and the police come up and ask me what am I there for with a truck sitting there with 4x4 four four swing sets. Literally. As a matter of fact, one of my best Air Force friends lives in that area, Mesquite, Box Springs, and all that stuff. He lives there now, and I got on the phone with him earlier and talked about it. That's an innocent boy that got shot with the rifle driving away in a, in a residential district with a rifle. A bullet from a rifle will travel over a mile on a level. I literally have a friend who died about six years ago who in 19, right at the time that um, 1-800-LOCK-YOU-UP came out in Tucson. Tucson was the target city for for doing it. I had just gotten out of the Air Force, so it had to be 77, 78. On New Year's Eve, he fired a rifle, and it went over five blocks, went through a Luan front door, and killed a baby being held by its grandmother. The bullet literally landed in the baby's head. His name was Mark Park. So you tell me a policeman used a rifle to fire a shot 
in a residential district. It, it, that's insane. That tells you they're hunting you. But as I pushed out before, steroids and drug abuse is high on the police force, always has been. But now that the majority of them are vets coming back from war conditions, watch most of them start using PTSD to try to get out of it. I'm going to let y'all go back to, to your program, but like I said, I just want to fill you in. Department of Justice covers over 60 different agencies, and they're doing nothing to help people. Juvenile delinquency, all kinds of stuff. You know, there was a picture earlier that I put out about California prisons or juvenile detention facilities where they had two kids holding up a sign, and the one kid had a graduation suit on, and I think it said California pays not something another dollars to educate me and the picture of the person standing next to him had up a sign that says California pays $64,000 and some odd to incarcerate me that tells you all the intentions and motives right there that you would spend $10,000 to incarcerate I mean to educate a kid that's it but if incarcerated it's worth 60 k what, what really gets me, that's why I get upset with the Maxine Waters and the Barbara Lees when they get on TV and toe the line with the Democratic thing about being outraged over Trump or Comey or any of them. They are the people that pass the laws to keep this stuff going. That's what really upsets me so much. They pretend that they care but if you count everybody that's been a part of the Congressional Black Caucus over the last 40 years, they've done nothing to support black or poor people, no matter what color they are. Yes, indeed. Uh, Scotty? Hey, peace, brother. Y'all keep doing your work. All right. Thank thanks. you for calling thanks. in, Otis, as always, man. Uh, and thanks for the information you share with us. Uh, we use it often, indeed. Shout out to you, brother. Man, but he's right. It's, it, they're covering all the areas that include this slavery and human trafficking. I mean, the Justice Department handling civil rights. You know what I mean? I know, and I've said this on the air before, that it seems to me, based on the things I've seen and researched here, that we are beneath notice. When the presidential campaigns came along, it was always the middle class and the rich. And uh, if they acted like 150 million people in this country are not either at slightly above or below the poverty level. I mean, we've only got a little more than 300 million, 320 million, and half of them are in poverty. So they acted like we didn't exist as if we were beneath notice. And the same thing applied when they did the, uh, the uh, campaigns with Columbia University to take the monies out uh, that they had investment, the divestment programs into the banks where Columbia University had like $30 million invested into the construction of private prisons, which for an educational facility is a conflict of interest. You're, you know, earning money on how many students potentially go to prison. And they had only $30 million in. For $30 million is a lot of money. That's really, you know, that's what, a, a little less than a year for a thousand men. Remember, it's $44 million. 4,000 men for one year. So 30 million is like 700 men for a year. That's that's what it was worth. That's our children, our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, and our fathers. But we were beneath notice because these institutions had tens of billions of dollars in assets. $30 million to them was like, oh, was that killing y'all? My bad. <laughs> I didn't know. And that's how they treat us. Like, they don't even know. They don't care. I remember when the president of the, the uh, of the the head of the Bureau of Prisons spoke before Congress and they asked him what size cell uh, what was the size of the cells used for solitary confinement he didn't have a freaking clue how are you going to be the president of the Bureau of Prisons and, and a black man at that and you don't even have a clue how big the damn cells you're putting human beings into are same thing happened also with the test when they testified before Congress in regards to the transportation company that was uh, taking prisoners from point A to point B 
prisoners were dying along the way. At least one prisoner was raped right behind the driver's seat, like right behind the driver's seat. Some were being uh, disappearing, like their bodies never showed up and nobody ever heard what happened to them. And they were written off in these, uh, being written off officially as like uh, accidental deaths or uh, escape or disappear. In any case, they talked about this in front of, Con- I believe it was Kamala Harris, when confronted with this information about what was happening out there in California, says she had no idea that the Department of Justice was using a private company to transport prisoners. No idea. You're the head of this stuff, and you got no idea, and people are dying through these private companies that are exploiting people's bodies, and you got no idea. Beneath notice. Doesn't matter. Just a few dead Negroes, a few dead Hispanics, a few dead whatevers, you know? Anyway, this is my story, and I'm sticking to it. Scotty? Um. Yeah, uh, I'm ready to move to the next story. I don't have anything else to say on that or to add to that. All right. Well, here's a here, um people need to know. And this comes out from uh, the Oregon, Oregon Live, the Oregonian. Oregonian? <laughs> and it's a story about a man who died in jail. It says, for more than five hours, this just came out a couple of days ago, for more than five hours, a Yamhill county jail inmate writhed in pain on his mattress, clutched his side, walked 19 times to the door to press an intercom button for help, and urinated blood in the toilet inside his cell. But no one came to help Jed Hawk Myers. According to jail records, video and police investigative reports, Myers moved to a medical cell about 7.30 p.m. on May 27th of 2015 after he was assaulted by two other inmates in his general population cell. Pause. I always tell you, man, any arrest, it doesn't matter. If you're put into a cell, it's a potential death sentence, even if you have never done nothing, which normally is what happens, because if you're in jail, it means you're innocent until proven guilty. Continue. Right. He appeared disoriented, with what looked like a dislocated shoulder and the complaints of pain to his side, jail guards noticed. But after an initial check from a medical technician, no nurse, doctor, deputy, or anyone monitored monitoring the medical cell from a surveillance control room came back into Meyer's cell to check on him until he fell to the floor beside his bed and appeared to stop breathing. Jail video and court reports show his head slumped and he didn't move again. Myers died alone about 1 a.m., on May 28, 2015, the day of his expected release from custody on a probation and post-prison supervision violation. See, Scotty, this is what I'm talking about. What this is what I nightmares I'm having about my son because that's right. what happens. Right. Myers died alone, 1 a.m. May 28, 2015, the day of his expected release from a custody on a probation and post-prison supervision violation. On Monday, a personal representative for Myers Estate filed a federal civil rights lawsuit against Yamhill County. It's jail guards and medical staff alleging they denied basic medical care to Myers and that their negligence led to his wrongful death. And that's what it was, negligence. <clears throat> the suit seeks $12 million in economic and non-economic damages, as well as unspecified punitive damages. Jail staff ignored all the obvious and hor- hor- horrific symptoms that were plainly visible on the monitor for over five hours. Attorney Matthew D. Kaplan wrote in the lawsuit, they basically isolated this guy who they knew was hurt and watched him die, Kaplan said. He has to stop breathing for them to finally go into his cell again and then check on him. And the video is right here of this man going through this. So I mean, it's a longer Max, part of the story. I'm not going to read it all. Over the past five this years, how, how many stories have we reported on this? On this very exact like same thing. Dying for, oh, you know, found dead in the jail. What was you doing in jail? You know, oh, they uh, throw me in jail because my pants were sagging. Or some other stupid reason. And that has happened. That happened. I know it happened. Yep. That's why I don't make up. Yep. You know I don't make up this stuff, Max. We report on this stuff on a weekly, well, we might well yep. say on a daily basis. We do this program 
on a weekly basis, but we're always, you know, researching and sharing information. Yeah. And, and, and abolitionists 24 hours a day. Yeah, man. So, so I mean, it's just so, and we've asked the question, aren't taxpayers tired of doling out this money? Apparently not. Apparently not. So, you know, it's just another one of those stories that should make people so angry that there is no other option but abolitionism. And this appears to be uh, a non-person of color. He's just like ordinary white guy, young white guy. He was in for violation of parole. And he was supposed to get out that day. I guess, he, you know, some of the jail was probably in there for a few months. And instead he ends up getting beat and dies. And that could have happened to anybody. Your grandmama, your mama, your little baby brother, anybody for any reason can end up in one of these cells and never come out like Sandra Bland. Well, you know, again, like I was playing a clip in between the programs of uh, Neely Fuller Jr. talking about, you know, justice isn't based on the skin color. And but in a historical context of slavery since it became race based and black only uh, from the Virginia slave codes in the late 1600s that perhaps for the first time since then in American history you now have white slaves in America but they want they don't want you to highlight that they don't want you to showcase these victims because there's so many of them and if if we can convince the the um uh how should i say this if we can convince the dominant population dominant meaning there's more of them than anyone else to to see this for what it is as slavery as the enslavement of human beings as the trafficking in human beings then you know we could just speed it up we could speed up the true abolition of slavery in the United States and if it happens here it's going to happen worldwide yes sir Scotty every day working on it little by little we've seen the changes coming and we've had a lot of uh, to do with the change in the mindset over these short years we are certainly not the first to talk about it and we're certainly not the first to make a difference but we're doing our part, and we hope that you will do the same. Uh, whatever your talent is, we need your contributions towards this goal, ending slavery. Um, with that being said, we got, uh, you know, down to our last half hour, want to get into our regular segments, if you don't mind, Scotty. Yeah, let's take our um, uh, last break of the night. It'll be real quick. Okay. Uh, in that case, you are listening to New Abolitionist Radio on the Black Talk Radio Network. Support Black-owned media. We'll be right back after these messages. Since 2008, providing new black media for the masses. Peace and welcome back to New Abolitionist Radio here on BlackTalkRadioNetwork.com. Um, Got to find our rider of the 21st Century Underground Railroad this week. And just pull it up here for us. I can locate it. Scotty, do you see it there? Which one? Right, a rider this week. I got so many articles in the trees. Um, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. <laughs> scrolling. Oh, let me give a shout out to to uh, my sister uh, Erica Walker, who put out a video for the Millions for Prisoners March on Washington. I'll share it on the page. 
Uh, basically, she was inspired by something I said, and she, the video came out to be really beautiful and powerful, and it explains what the problem is and the misconceptions that we have. Is it Jerry so, Miller? Check it out. Yes, sir. That's the one. Okay, I'm pulling it up now. Yet. What happened is it didn't load up a preview, but it's from the Innocent uh, Project, right? Yes, sir. If you if you don't mind, you can do that one. Yes, and, uh, sir. The next yes, one sir. Was a I'll video. do that one. I'll do that. Just waiting on it to load up. And again, shout out to the Innocence Project. They do great work. Um, I've been knowing about them for the nine years that I've been, you know, uh, producing political pro, uh, pro, uh, podcasts and radio programs. And they do uh, invaluable uh, service like Max. Um, has named them, you know, the the Underground Railroad conductors, you know, freeing people from slavery. So this is from the Innocence Project. You can visit them online at innocenceproject.org. Um, the focus is Jerry Miller, who spent 25 years in modern day slavery. Uh, let me close this pop up ad. Um, not a pop up ad, but um, they're asking for donations, and they're a worthy organization. On April the twenty third, two thousand and seven, Jerry Miller became the two hundredth person in the United States exonerated through DNA evidence. Though he had been paroled a year earlier, Miller had spent more than twenty four years in the Illinois prison system for a rape that he did not commit. The crime. At the 9.30 p.m. on September the 16th, 1981, the victim walked to her car on the roof deck of a garage on Rush Street in downtown Chicago. As she opened the car door, someone pushed her into the car. The man then beat her, took her money and gold chain from her, and brutally raped her. He forced her into the trunk of her own car and began driving out of the parking structure. The parking lot cashier recognized the victim's car and was suspicious. She told the man to back up and went to get another employee. At that time, the man fled from the scene on foot. The two parking lot employees heard the victim yelling inside the trunk and were able to free her using a set of keys left on the floorboard. They probably saved her life. The identification. When a Chicago Police Department officer saw the composite drawing and description of the perpetrator based on the memory of the memory of the two garage attendants, he thought of Jerry Miller, who he claimed had been several days, who he had seen several days before the crime looking into the window of a parked car. Come on, dude. Miller was arrested. When the victim was initially questioned by the police, she said she was not sure whether she could identify her assailant because she he had instructed her to keep her eyes closed or he was going to kill her. While hospitalized, the victim was shown a photo array of young black men in their late teens or early 20s, but she was unable to positively identify her assailant. She did tentatively identify Miller at trial, saying that his facial hair looked different. Miller was identified in a lineup by both of the parking lot employees. And I'm willing to bet that the slave catchers tipped them off on who they was targeting and who they wanted to pin this on. The biological evidence. The wounds to the victim were such that a normal rape kit could not be collected. However, the police were still able to collect the victim's clothing. Most importantly, they collected a slip that had sperm on the fringes. The defense, Miller and his father testified that on the night of the crime, they were watching a pay-per-view boxing match between Tommy Hearns and Sugar Ray Leonard. Um, I remember that fight. I was watching it too. On October the 1st, 1982, Miller was convicted of rape, robbery, and kidnapping. Post-conviction, the Innocence Project took on Miller's case in 2005. The Cook County, one of the most notoriously crooked uh, counties in the United States, the home of John Burge. John Burge, I'm, I'm surprised John Burge ain't being mentioned here. I was about to think that, oh, did John Burge torture him into a confession? Okay, but it says the Innocent Project took on Miller's case in 2005. The Cook County's clerk's office located the slip and sent it to Strand Analytical Laboratory for DNA testing. After DNA testing excluded Miller, the Cook County State's Attorney Office joined the Innocence Project in the Cook County Public Defender's Office in a joint motion to vacate and dismiss Miller's conviction. The perpetrator's profile was also entered into the FBI convicted offender database, which implicated another 
another man, Robert Weeks, as the true perpetrator in the case. Weeks is currently facing charges in several other assault uh, cases. Uh, new abolitionist radio salutes Jerry Miller. Um, welcome to freedom. Salute. Welcome to freedom, man. What it's worth. Mm-mm-mm. Stand your few days in the sun while you can. Mm. And his story, man. his story just reminds me, I believe it was Arkansas that may have just executed a man while refusing his motion to have a DNA analysis done on the evidence that they had collected. So in some cases, they don't even care. They have the DNA. How do you explain that, Max? How do you explain the mindset Notice. of someone who knows you have the DNA evidence, but you rather put this man to death without making sure that you have the right person? I don't know how sociopathic to natures would be a good answer to that. A and savage. as I said earlier, they see us as beneath notice. It's just like they don't care. We're just another piece of meat going through there. 150 million people in this country are just another piece of meat to go through the system. Mm-mm-mm. And they just don't care. These prosecutors will proudly brag about their 98, 99% prosecution rate. Like, you ain't gonna beat me. I'm gonna send you to prison every time. You hear me? Every time. Mm-mm-mm. That's how they roll. It's, it's and just then they'll sick, be man, in your know, ass in the 30 years. It's just sick to know that these people are among us, you know. You could be standing behind them in the checkout line at a store. You could be sitting next to them in the pews in your church. But this is who they really are. It's sick, man, and it, it just makes yes, me angry. Well, with that said, our next segment is a video. It's a three-minute video, Scotty, and it's in honor of uh, our new segment, For Freedom's Sake, A History of Rebellion. I put it in the Uber Conference chat, the link, so you can pull it I up can't, play. I can't pull it up there, and, Max, because it will, will, for whatever reason, right. it shuts my... It's it, also our new abolitionist page, the okay. Facebook page. Okay. Third one down. Okay, I Second can look. find that one. All right. So uh, just yes, give me a moment to find and, it. Uh, yes. And I will tell them a little bit about it. It's a video that talks about the Nat Turner Rebellion. So today we've got, you know, equal sides. We've got Nat Turner and his rebellion. We'll be sharing this video with you. And then afterwards, we'll be reading the very final words of John Brown, the abolitionist whose birthday was yesterday. Um, as Scotty gets the video ready to play. You know, this just came out as a movie recently, too. <laughs> I have to be honest, I only saw half of it so far. Just some things kind of just turned me off. But in any case, we here at New Abolitionist Radio are remembering that. I'm still trying to get to it, Max. Okay, <laughs> I think I well, said the untold about truth about Nat Turner's rebellion. I found Yes, it. sir. Okay. Here we go. We may assume that the story of Nat Turner was told to us in full, but a closer look inside of the hidden spectrums of history determines otherwise. Here are very intricate details to the untold informative accounts of what is hidden in plain sight. Nat Turner was a motivational religious preacher born in Southampton County, Virginia on October 2nd, 1800. He led a slave rebellion group of people that slaughtered the lives of their kidnappers, or how history likes to title them, slave masters. According to many records and a novel, the European settlers described the famous rebellion act of Nat Turner as one of the same aftermaths of the Indian slave rebellions that they were encountering since 1712, well over a hundred years prior to Nat Turner's rebellion, describing their actions as gruesome, gory, vicious, and ungodly. Bodies were viciously hacked up and left on the grounds to hang all while decaying body parts were being picked by vultures, including all of their slave masters' family members, men, women, and their children and infants, not leaving a single life to live as they savagely saw fit. 
It was the very same actions that Nat Turner discovered all while traveling throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia, all along the reservation of the Powhatan Nation, granted with the slave master's permission due to being a preacher of different surrounding counties. In 2015, as a part of the 15th anniversary of the 1954 Supreme Court desegregation decision, the state of Virginia instituted a Civil Rights and Education Heritage Tour located on the reservation of the Powhatan Nation in Southampton. The Commonwealth started a driving tour that takes you through the south side of Virginia in the middle of a four, traveling to witness the grave sites of the native Aborigines known as Indian slaves at that time of Berlin. Tourist attractions in Fort Christiana are presented along with the area in which the Nat Turner Rebellion took place. Another familiar name of the Powhatan Nation is the native Aborigine by the name of Pocahontas, famously known for the Walt Disney manipulated interpretation of her characteristics and persona. They finally caught up with Nat Turner after the slaughtering decimated, hiding inside of a cave-like pit that was occupied by Indians at that time. These people are called the Nataway Indians that hid Nat Turner and his family from danger. This is the part of history that was left out of most of the stories you hear about Nat Turner. What is important to note, if Indians are what they show and tell us they are today, of Western tribe descent, with straight like hair and the alkaline features, then how could Nat Turner and his family live and hide amongst them for so long if they didn't look like him. I'm just here to make you think. There you have it. Story of Nat Turner's, Turner's Rebellion. We're here at New Abolitionist Radio. Remember the rebellion. That's very interesting that you would choose that, Max. Because I was having a conversation on social media with someone about slavery and they, it seemed like they were trying to minimize. Believe it or not, we have some people who believe a, a transatlantic slave trade never happened. Um, this person wasn't one of those persons, but she tried to say it was very few that they brought over here. And I was like, well, what does that matter? They still bred them once they got here to produce millions of, of slaves. And I, it, you know, and then um, she started talking about Indian, uh, the enslavement of, of um, Native Americans here. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. They have. I've read a lot about that too. But this is the first time I've heard that um, Native Americans being associated with uh, uh, Nat Turner and helping to hide him. Um, because there are some people and unfortunately well-known people who try to drive wedges between different communities. And I say it's cause you're ignorant of history. I said slavery on this continent is just not simply, you know, the way that it's as simple as they trying to present it. Um, the Seminole Indians, uh, look up John horse. John horse was a enslaved African who escaped slavery like so many other enslaved Africans and made their way to Florida and joined up with the Seminole Indians and battled the United States Army to a standstill in the swamps of Florida. They battled them to the point that they had to had to agree to a ceasefire and just allow them to leave and make their way to um, Mexico which is where they eventually settled. But of course, they uh, they they tried to get the the um, Seminole Indians to hey, we'll let y'all be if y'all just turn in these African slaves and what have you, and they refused to do it. So you know, I'm not trying to drive a wedge between any community when it comes to slavery. I'm not trying to minimize anybody's story, but at the same time, we know the biggest victims have been Afro descendant people. And nobody should be trying to minimize that and trying. Well, who you know who? It's like they run. Is they are they offering some kind of reward for uh, who's the most oppressed in this country? Why not the oppressed just unite? You know, but it is very important that we uncover this type of history, and we will see that uh, uh, the the black the black family was not alone in its opposition to slavery on this continent. 
Indeed, Scotty. Uh, and, you know, uh, that's a perfect segue into the next and last segment, which is our abolitionists in profile. So today we're remembering John Brown, who uh, died on October 16th, 1859, and was born on May 9th, 1800. So, my son, you share a birthday with John Brown. These were his final words. On October 16, 1859, John Brown and nearly two dozen comrades seized the armory at Harper's Ferry in West Virginia, hoping to use his massive arsenal in the struggle to forcibly end slavery. Captured and brought to trial at nearby Charlestown, Brown was found guilty of treason. One month before his execution, John Brown addressed a courtroom in Charleston, West Virginia, defending his role in the action at Harper's Ferry. Henry David Thoreau, although himself did not favor violence, praised John Brown. And when the fiery preacher was sentenced to death, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, he will make the gallows holy as the cross. The words of John Brown. May it please. But what I have all along admitted, the design on my part to free the slaves, I intended certainly to have made a clean thing of the matter, as I did last winter when I went into Missouri and there took slaves without the snapping of a gun on either side, moved them through the country, and finally left them in Canada. I designed to have done the same thing again on a larger scale. That was all I intended. I never did intend murder or treason or the destruction of property or to excite or incite slaves to rebellion or to make insurrection. I have <clears throat> another objection, and that is, it is unjust that I should suffer such a penalty. Had I interfered in the manner which I admit and which I admit was been fairly proved, for I admire the truthfulness and candor of the greater portion of the witnesses who have testified in this case. Had I so interfered in behalf of the rich, the powerful, the intelligent, the so-called great, or in behalf of any of their friends, either father, mother, brother, sister, wife, or children, or any of that class, and suffered and sacrificed what I have in this interference, it would have been all right. And every man in this court would have deemed it an act worthy of reward rather than punishment. This court acknowledges, as I suppose, the validity of the law of God. I see a book kissed here, which I suppose to be the Bible, or at least the New Testament, that teaches me that all things whatsoever I would that men should do to me, I should do to even so to them. It teaches me further to remember that them that are in bonds, as bonds, as bound with them. <clears throat> I endeavored to act up to that insurrection, or to that instruction. I say, I am yet too young to understand that God is any respecter of persons. I believe that to have interfered as I have done, as I have always freely admitted, I have done in behalf of his despised poor, was not wrong, but right. Now, if it is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of the end of justice and mingle my blood further with the blood of my children and with the blood of millions in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by the wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, I submit, so let it be done. Let me say one word further. I feel entirely satisfied with the treatment I have received on my trial. Considering all the circumstances, it has been more generous than I expected, but I feel no consciousness of guilt. I have stated from the first what was my intentions and what was not. I never had any design against the life of any person nor any disposition to commit treason or excite slaves to rebel or make any general insurrection. I never encouraged any man to do so, but always discouraged any idea of that kind. Let me say also a word in regards to the statements made by some of those connected with me. I hear it has been stated by some of them that I have induced them to join me, but the contrary is true. I do not say this to injure them, but as regretting their weakness. There is not one of them but joined me of his own accord, and the greater part of them at their own expense. 
a number of them I never saw and never had a word of conversation with till that day they came to me. And that was the purpose I have stated. Now I have done. Wendote County, Kansas, John Brown, Revolutionary Abolitionist. We here at New Abolitionist Radio salute you. Salute. Man, the last words of John Brown. He was like, yo, I'm not trying to commit treason. And if I had to did this with your rich asses, you would have been smacking me on the back well, saying, well done. Well, Max, <laughs> here's my thought on that. And I don't want to take out too much time because we're running out of time. Got to get the next program on air. Yes, we're out but of time. this is how I feel about that treason word. Uh, I pledge no allegiance to no government that practices legalized slavery and human trafficking. And I'll leave it at that. Yes, sir. Exactly. With that being said, um, any final comments, Scotty, for the evening? Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, Otis, always calling in with some great information. Um, he's, like he said, he spends a lot of time reading. And like I've heard other people say, reading is more important than watching television, which I actually saw a video today that says that television ratings are down 44 percent so that's some good news right so um yeah just want to encourage all the abolitionists out there even though you know the purpose of this program is to highlight slavery and human trafficking and they're not feel good stories every once in a while we'll have a feel good story or a positive story to to report um, but, you know, it's just very important that you as an abolitionist do what you can do to educate your family members first, educate your immediate uh, neighbors second, your which is part of your community. And, just you know, because the more numbers we have, the greater likelihood that we will succeed. And I have no doubt that we will succeed. It might even happen in my lifetime. Um, I'm praying that it's going to be in my lifetime. I would hate to have uh, my grandsons and granddaughters uh, grow up and still be fighting this battle to end slavery uh, and human trafficking. Not the illegal kind. Not the kind that's already illegal. Yeah, we need to end that too. But it's more egregious when governments practice it and it's legalized. So, you know, shout out to the abolitionists. Remain encouraged. We will see you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. Yes, sir. I'm going to keep mine simple. For these years here on air, I've always started and ended this program with the same word. Remember that abolition is a reason for revolution so we can finally know it. Peace. Rise up, rise up, rise up. Just lift your eyes up, let your wise rise up, see the signs of the times if it's time. Rise up, rise up, when death and hell dwell among all God's people, when those we chose and trusted have become completely corrupted and inherently evil, when the feast that feeds you starves our father's children, when snuff porn and pedo forms begin to get top billing, rise up, when famine claims millions, when justice gives blind eyes to billions, when the Lord anger is no longer feared if his protection is gone and your enemies are near if you've seen the sea spill over and the mountains shake break and fall if the moon ever turns blood red and you can't see the sun at all rise up no matter if the prize is high in the skies or deep deep in perdition if our leaders are globally despised and always seem to rise through attrition or blatant nepotism if women and children have to live in impossible conditions if you have to die due to someone else's damn decisions rise up when innocent citizens perish for all our sins sake if the future seems bleak and your soul's at stake rise up when it appears that any hope left may already be lost if the price is your son or your daughter's life and you refuse to pay the cost if you've ever had to ask god why 
and the thunder roll. If you just once had to wonder, have we sold our souls? Rise up for the life of an unborn child. When the homeless are reviled and the masses are beguiled, rise up when our doctrines dictate that we all deal in death. When we stop giving more and we start caring less, if the best we can do has already been done, if the battle isn't won and the fighting just begun.